Well, good morning, Gateway. How are y'all doing? A few people excited, a few people tired. I don't know. I talked to a lot of people this morning in the foyer who are like, oh, I'm just so tired. And I, I get it. I get it. It's, it's, it's the season. It's the time of year. Um, well, but good morning. And, and, and thank you for joining us for week three of our Advent series that we're calling Surrendered. Now, I don't know about you, but next week being Christmas is blowing my mind. Like, where did the year go? Where, where's 2023 gone? Is I thought it was January still. What, like, what happened to this year? Um, and, and just to reiterate what Joy was saying, next week, no service in the morning. We're, we're going to mention it a thousand times so that people remember. No service in the morning. We have our evening service. And we just encourage you to, to invite friends, invite family, join us in person, online. We're just going to be celebrating Jesus. You know, it's the greatest celebration we can have is just this opportunity to celebrate Jesus, who he is, what he did, and the, the stunning reality that God sent his son to earth for us out of love. And so that, that's next Sunday. It'll be a carol-oriented service, candlelit service. It's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure to come on out for that. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I want to... Talk, continue on our series of talking about surrendering to God. Because, you know, throughout this year, our word for the year of 2023 was this idea of the importance and value of surrender. It's this idea that we would lay down our lives, we would lay down our desires, we would lay down our wants and, 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 and our resources, and we would lay ourselves down and give ourselves fully to God. That in moments of stress, we would lay down that situation to God and we would trust him. In moments of hopelessness, we would give that to God and say, God, I will trust you. In moments of great joy, that, that we would surrender ourselves to God. And say, God, do what you want to do in my life. Do what you want to do through my life. God, I am yours. And we've talked throughout this whole year on this idea of surrender. How we are children of God. And so we have this open invitation as children of God to, to not only approach the throne of grace, to not only have a relationship with our Father, but also to access his power. That the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1 tells us, is dwelling inside of us as a seal of the promise of God. That we have God with us and we have the access to the hope and inheritance and power of God through us. We've talked as well about, about the different false gods we'll ser we, we can serve and the different things that try to distract us from God. But it's all been about this idea of surrender. That God is looking for people who will say, God, I am yours. Take me. Use me. I trust you. And this is the idea we've been looking at throughout this series as we close out the year. Being surrendered to God. It's this idea of surrendering our hopeless situations and trusting God that in the midst of what seems hopeless to us, he will fulfill what he has promised. And last week we talked about surrendering when we don't have peace. How often in stressful and worrying situations, how we will, we will worry and we'll try to figure things out on our own, but how God is asking, will you surrender to me? And when you do, Philippians 4 tells us that the peace of God guards your heart. It's a show of military force. God will guard your heart. But this morning, as we continue on this series, I want to talk about another area that I think can be very difficult to surrender in, specifically when dealing with tragedy and struggles and stress. I want to talk about being surrendered to joy. You see, I find, and maybe you can relate with me on this, but I find that often hope, peace, and joy are, there's this intrinsic link between the three of them. It's like, if I'm dealing with a difficult situation and I lose hope, well, naturally the peace disappears and the joy disappears. 
It's like if, I, if I'm struggling with this, some stressful thing, I might have hope in God that he will make a way, but I'm still stressing about the details and I've lost my peace. And often when life is difficult, the thing that we lose immediately is our joy. We think joy is based on circumstances. And so if our circumstances don't line up with what we want them to be, we tend to enter into this depressive, saddened, joyless state. For example, I, I shared, I've shared this a couple times, but um, my, my dad's been dealing with some pretty severe dementia for, for many, many years. And before he, um, before he got diagnosed and it got really bad, God gave him this word that he was going to heal him. And I was just in Ontario visiting my folks this past week, and my mom actually reminded me that in that moment, God had told my dad, I will heal you of this dementia, and to prove it, I will heal your shoulder. He was dealing with some severe shoulder pain. And instantly, all the pain in his shoulder left. And so we're like, okay, this is clearly from God. But do you know who didn't put their trust and hope and peace in God? It's me. Just going to be real. And it wasn't until someone reminded me, hey, this is what God said. This is what God's going to do. And even this past week, we, we were visiting my folks, and, and, and as we were going out, um, God, I felt God put on my heart, like, I needed to take three days to prepare the space. And then we were going to lay hands on him and pray for him. And the word that I got was that there was going to be a breakthrough. And so walked into the house the first day, immediately started dealing with spiritual warfare, started dealing with these, these things that were causing confusion and chaos in the house. Three days later, we prayed for my dad, and God had said there would be a breakthrough. He didn't say what the breakthrough would be. And I immediately thought, he's going to be healed. It'll be amazing. And we prayed for him, and the next day, nothing had changed. And it was very, very easy for me that day to be like, okay, God, well, I must have gotten it wrong. And I lost my joy in that situation. And, and God had to remind me, no, 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 no. You, I didn't tell you what it was going to look like. You wanted a physical manifestation. That's not what I was doing. Regardless, God showed me this image that he's the one dealing with my dad. He's the one healing him. So while I can do whatever I want to try and fix it, God's the one in charge. And even after that time, even though I felt hopeless, progress kept being made and God kept moving. And the reason I share all that is because it's so easy for us when dealing with situations where we're not in control, it's easy for us to lose our hope. And then as we lose our hope, we lose our peace. We stress about the situation. And as we lose our peace, we lose our joy. And suddenly we find ourselves in this place where we are lacking joy. We are lacking this, this excitement. We are not giving thanks to God because the situation is so hard. And God, why are you doing something here? And we lose what God has already given us. And really, the, the, the important thing is we need to learn, as people and as a church, to not base our understanding of God on our experiences. But we need to learn to surrender until our experiences line up with God's. See, there are situations in your life where your, the earthly report is bad. It's like the person is dying. The job is lost. The problem is happening. Like there, There's a bad situation, and from a human perspective, it looks bad. But from heaven's perspective, God is making a way. And we need to shift our focus to stop looking at things through humanly eyes, at human problems, and being like, God, why aren't you fixing that? When God has already said, this is what I'm doing. We need to find our joy, even in the midst of struggle. But the problem is we base our joy on circumstances. 
And so if the circumstances are bad, we naturally lose that joy. In Romans 15, verse 13, this has kind of been a core verse for this, this, this series. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love this verse because it made the God of hope. Hope is eager, active expectation. May the God of hope, that is a defining characteristic of God. God is eagerly expecting. May the God of hope fill you. The wording there is not like give you a drop. It's not like you, you, you go to the grocery store and you pick up a bag of chips and, oh, look, it shrank by 10% again. It's not how God works. The bag is completely full. There's not even an ounce of air in there. May he fill you with all joy. Joy. In the Greek, it's not this idea of happiness. It's this idea of rejoicing and thanksgiving. May he fill you with all joy and peace. We talked about this last week. Peace isn't, the, the, isn't a lack of bad circumstances. Peace is the presence of a person so that you may abound in hope, eager expectation, by the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we live in hope and peace and in joy? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by your strength, not by your abilities, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can abound in joy. And you know, this, this passage in particular, Paul He's writing this about Jesus. He's writing this about how through Jesus, everyone now has access to the Father. Whether you're born a Jew or you're not, everyone has access to the Father. So we all have access to the hope and joy and peace of God. But the context of the world he's writing this to was not a peaceful or joy-filled place. And so the question arises, what does it mean to have joy when life is tough? What does it look like to be filled with joy when things are bad? Because I don't know about you, but but when I get bad news, I'm not going to be like jumping up and down like, oh my goodness, I just lost a thousand dollars, yay! Yay! Like, no one's going to be on social media posting, oh, look, I just lost my job, exclamation point, exclamation point. Maybe you will if you hate your job, but still. Nobody's going to their friends' houses and bragging about how the bad life choices their kids are making. Like, we, we don't do that. And so often, though, we think that joy is, it has to be based on our circumstances, So we think, I can't be joyful if these bad things are happening. I can't be joyful when when we get the bad news report. I can't be joyful when when my family member dies. I can't be joyful when this situation happens. I can't be joyful when when problems arise. I can't be joyful. But joy is not based on, on anything you can do. Joy is not based on your circumstances. Joy is based on your Savior. See, in James chapter 1, we find this fascinating verse that I absolutely hate. Just being real. It says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face various trials, how many of you like facing trials? No one. Wow. Okay. Not wow. I'm not surprised. I don't either. Consider it all joy. What do we consider all joy? When we face trials. Now that sounds like an oxymoron. It says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance complete its work so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. You face various trials, consider it all joy. You know, this verse just highlights this reality that how we feel inside, in the midst of trials, does not have to be defined by the trial. You know, in the Greek text, 
this, this passage was written originally in, in ancient Greek. In the Greek text, the wording that James uses for joy is the Greek word zara, which it doesn't mean just be happy. It means rejoice, give thanks. Consider it all joy. Rejoice, give thanks, specifically in God even when you face trials. Because you know that the trials will produce a better thing. Now, I had a Bible college prof. I can't remember the exact quote, but he said happiness is based on happenings. So our happiness is dependent on how we feel in a circumstance. But joy, this is where I butcher the quote. I can't remember what he said. But joy is based on on our Savior. So it doesn't matter what happens in our lives. We can have joy. Why? Because of Jesus. You know, the world that Jesus came into when he was born in about 2,000 years ago, it was a world that was filled with hopelessness, a lack of peace, and a lack of joy. You know, if you know Israelite history from before Jesus, you'll know that Israel, God had made Israel all kinds of promises about what he was going to do for them, how he was going to take care of them, how he was going to provide for them. But by the time we come to Jesus in the story, none of the promises have come to pass. And Israel, they have been in captivity for hundreds of years. A lot of their people were carried off to foreign nations. And when they were finally allowed to return, they rebuilt their capital city, Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple of God. But there's this profound sense of God's presence being absent. And really, the Old Testament, it ends on this cliffhanger of God has given all these promises, but none of them seem to have been fulfilled. For instance, in in, in Exodus... We see God, he speaks to the people of Israel. This is right before he gives them the Ten Commandments. He says, Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. This is a calling. God is saying, Israel, this is your mandate. This is your calling. I am calling you to be priests to represent me to the world. And if you will just follow me, I will take care of you. That's a promise. And later on in, in, in 2 Samuel verse, or chapter 7, the, the prophet Nathaniel, he speaks to, to David, to King David at the time. He says, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, that means when he dies, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's a promise. God is saying out of the line of David's kingship, there will be a king who rules over Israel forever. That's a promise God is making. Isaiah 55, well actually chapter Isaiah 40 to 55, it's this, this story of the suffering servant. And how Israel, though they have fallen and, and they've been abandoned and they've ha- suffered hardship, how the suffering servant will come in and will rescue them. And it ends with Isaiah 55, this is known as the song of the suffering servant. This is verse 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So Israel has all these promises. They have this promise, pursue God, he will take care of you. They stop pursuing him, and they start start to suffer. Then they, David has this promise, your line will carry on forever. And at this point in history, Israel doesn't have a king. They're stuck. Again, at the time of Jesus, they're stuck under the rulership 
of a foreign emperor who installed a puppet king who they don't even like. This promise of restoration, that's Isaiah 55, it's restoration. You shall have joy. What once produced thorns and, 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 and problems will now produce new life. It will be restored to you. But hundreds of years have passed since that prophecy was made. And Israel has none of it. Their whole history, the whole Old Testament, all of these promises God made to Israel, none of them have come to pass. And they're waiting. They're expecting. They're looking for a Messiah, a Savior. And specifically, they believed that this Messiah would rise up. He would come with a sword and military might, and he would defeat Rome, and Israel's kingdom would be established once more. But you know, very often, we put our hope and our peace and our joy and expectation in what we think God should do. when God doesn't always operate the way we think he should. Now, I was reading a book this past week that was talking about the, the Israelite can, uh, conquest of Canaan. And what, one of the things that really stood out to me in this book was how we as people, we tend to define goodness based on our perspective of what is good, which in the current humanistic society means what makes me happy. We define goodness by what makes me happy. God defines goodness by what is right. His definition of goodness doesn't line up with ours. So sometimes God will do things in a way that you don't expect. And it's not because he's not good. It's because he is good and he's working it out for your good. See, Jesus, he steps onto the scene. Luke chapter 4. He's this baby He's born in a manger. There's no reason people should look up to him. There's no reason anyone should honor him. He's he's a nobody. He's born. He's the son of God. And as the ministry starts, Jesus, it says in Luke 4, he he goes, he gets baptized by, by John the Baptist, his cousin, and the heavens open and God speaks down from heaven, says, this is my son, the beloved whom I love. The Holy Spirit descends on him and remains on him in power. And then the rest of the Luke 4 up to this point in this verse, it, it's Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But once Jesus has defeated the devil and he said no to the temptations of sin, it tells us that Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, began to proclaim the kingdom of God has come near. And right at the start of his ministry, Luke records this interaction. It says, when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, it's easy for us to look at this passage and be like, okay, cool, that's great. Thank you, Jesus. And to miss what's going on. See, Jesus, this passage from Isaiah, Jesus is reading, it's Isaiah 61. And specifically in the Jewish culture, it was known as the Messiah's mandate. It was the mission that the people believed that the Messiah would accomplish. Again, they thought, He would come, show of military force, defeat Rome. And Jesus steps into the scene. He's grown up in Nazareth. He steps into the scene. He says, this scripture has been fulfilled in me, in Jesus. And if you know the story, their reaction is they try to take him and throw him off a cliff. But I love this passage because it highlights Jesus' mission. If we can go back to it for a second. 
He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Now that phrase specifically in the Greek, it's used elsewhere in the New Testament to talk about forgiveness of sins. Good news to the poor. It's this idea that we are in spiritual poverty and through Jesus we have good news. Romans talks about it as as if we're, we're all sheep who've gone astray. None of us is righteous. No, not one. But in Jesus, we have been forgiven. And he goes on. He says, uh, this, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Again, this wording, it can indicate two things. One, it can indicate freedom from sin, forgiveness of sin. But secondly, it highlights a core aspect of Jesus' ministry. He went about proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand and healing the sick. Luke 10, Jesus talks, I think it's Luke 10, but Jesus sends out the 72 and he gives them authority over demons and over sicknesses to cast them out. Part of Jesus' ministry is this freedom, salvation, deliverance, and healing. Recovery of sight to the blind, both those spiritually blind and physically blind. Physical healing and spiritual reconciliation with God. Set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That idea of the year of the Lord's favor, it ties into the Levitical law. Specifically in, in, in the, the Mosaic law or, or the law that Israel followed, every 50 years they were supposed to have a year called the year of Jubilee. And on the year of Jubilee, all the slaves were, be, were to be set free and all the debts canceled. Now we have no record of that ever happening, but that was what God told them to do. And it's this imagery, Jesus is painting this picture of liberation of freedom, of debts being canceled, of forgiveness being poured out, and of salvation, healing, and deliverance coming. And this is the message that Jesus declares. That in him, we can have hope. In him, we can have peace. In him, we can have joy. Why? Because of what he accomplished for us on the cross. See, constantly throughout the scripture, we're told to rejoice. The word rejoice, it, it's, it doesn't, like the, the principle of rejoice is this idea of be filled with joy. Be overflowing with joy and thanksgiving for God. Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say Rejoice. Second Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. James 1, 2, which we just read earlier, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face various trials, consider it all joy. 1 Peter chapter 1, in this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials. I don't think I have this on this slide, but he goes on and he says, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We get this constant picture in Scripture of even though life can be tough, we are to rejoice. I would propose that the reason this command is in Scripture so often, this is just four examples out of the New Testament. The reason this command is in Scripture so often is because joy is not based on circumstances. Joy is not based on what we're dealing with or our stresses, or how work is going, or how good our kids are behaving. Joy is not based on how successful our marriage is, or, or if life is good or not, or if we have money in the bank or not. Joy is not based on our circumstances. Our joy is based on our Savior. 
and the invitation that we all have is in the midst of whatever we're dealing with, will we focus our eyes on our problem or will we focus our eyes on Jesus? Now, I've had to do this exercise many times in my life when struggling with things or problems or, or whatever, stresses. Because when those things arise, it's natural to lose your joy. So I've started to make the habit of in those moments where I'm overwhelmed and I've lost that joy, to start listing out everything I can think of that God's done for me. The miracles I've seen, the healings that have happened, the, the ways God has spoken to me in powerful, just loving ways. If I'm honest, the first moment, the first thing, it, it always takes forever to think of. I'm like, I'm stuck in this place and I can't fix my eyes on Jesus. You know, Hebrews 12 says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's run the race with perseverance. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. We need to focus on Jesus not on what we're dealing with, not on what we're seeing, not on how we're feeling, but we need to focus on Jesus. That we might see things from his perspective. And when we see things from his perspective, then we know it doesn't matter what I do because this is what God's doing. And if God is doing this, then there's nothing I need to worry about. Because God is greater in whatever we're facing. So the key is we need to give thanks. We need to focus on Jesus. We need to rejoice in the Lord. We need to give thanks to God. In seasons where we feel like it and in seasons where we don't. Now in John 16, I can find it amid my million bookmarks. Jesus is telling his disciples how he's going to leave. He's going to die. They're no longer going to see him. Their lives are going to be changed. And towards the end of this speech, he makes this comment. He says, very truly I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Ask and you will receive. You'll be sad because things are changing. Persecution is happening. Life will be difficult. But seek my Father. Ask God. And he will give it to you. Now I propose that joy is available to us no matter the circumstance. We just have to fix our eyes on Jesus and receive the joy of him the joy of what he is doing, no matter what the circumstance. You know, as we close this morning, this whole series, we've been trying to take some extra time at the end of the messages just to do practical applications of these things to our lives. So what I want us to do as we close is just to practice joy. You know, every Sunday, part of our service is, is that we gather and we worship. We sing songs, we praise God, we, we give Him thanks through prayer and through worship. So in a moment, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, the band is going to start to play. And as they play, I would just encourage you, no matter the circumstance you're facing, no matter how you're feeling in this moment, 
to sing, dance, jump, throw your arms in the air and praise God despite the circumstance. You know, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy. It's the third one. So when we have the Holy Spirit living in our hearts, He produces joy. And we have access to the joy of God no matter what we face. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray. And then we're just going to rejoice. But before I pray, I just want to invite you, if you're here, and I know Erica and Joy have had words about this, but about heaviness and things like that, sorrow. But if you're here and you're like, I need a fresh filling of joy, I just want to encourage you as I pray to put out your hands like this. This is a posture of receiving. It's just, I need a fresh filling of joy. As I pray, we're going to be asking God to fill us with his joy. To fill us with his, his abundant joy joy. You know, when we prayed over my dad on Wednesday, one of the things that my brother prayed was that God would restore joy. And for the first time in over a year, my dad started to laugh. Watched a, I think he was watching an old sitcom on TV and he started to laugh. Just a simple thing. But God is the source of joy. He will give it to those who ask. So Father God, we just We exalt your name. Lord, we thank you that you are God and you are good. We thank you that through your death on the cross that we have access to hope and peace and joy. We have access to things that are beyond our understanding because you are the powerful one. You are the powerful God. You have overcome the world. You have conquered the works of the devil. And you are restoring this world to be filled with the knowledge of you. God, right now, you know the situations people in this room are facing. You know the struggles that are on our minds. You know the stresses and worries and concerns and hopelessness and lack of peace and and problems that have arisen, whether it's because of Christmas or because of circumstances, God. And Father, I just thank you that, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have access to the gifts of heaven. We have access to your joy. So Father, right now, we just invite your joy to fill this place. Holy Spirit, come, fall on us, Lord. Fill your people, God, with your joy. God, the overwhelming joy of the Spirit, the overwhelming joy of God that can rejoice in the midst of problems and rejoice in the midst of circumstances and rejoice in the midst of stress and say, God, I trust you because you and you alone are good. So Jesus, we just ask for this bubbling up of joy from inside, for this thanksgiving and this rejoicing to come up inside of our hearts that we'll just be overwhelmed with your spirit and your power, your presence, and your joy. And God, I just pray that as we praise you, as we thank you, as we rejoice in you, that your joy will fill us to overflowing. That we'll be able to hold on to that and surrender to your joy no matter what. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you right now. This is your church. This is your place. Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. As we praise your name.